Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here with us today. I'm Katie. I'm the coordinator of the University Express program, and we're here with Julia from the health department. Welcome, Julia. Hi. How are you guys doing? Oh, well, hopefully good. <laughs> I forgot you terrified me. <laughs> hopefully good. Um, you are all muted and without your video showing, but we'll communicate with you through the Q&A panel. So looks like we've got a lot of regulars on here, so hopefully you know how to access that because Julia's got a packed day today. So I'm just going to quickly read her bio and I'm going to turn it over to her so she can get right started. So Julia is a public health educator for the Erie County Department of Health. She is a master's of public health from George Washington University. She's worked for the Erie County Department of Health since 2016 when she previously worked as a sanitarian where she conducted inspections of pools, restaurants, and other permitted facilities in Erie County. While she's relatively new to working in the field of community health, she has made strides to improve the lives and health of those she interacts with, and that's why she's here today. Julia, thank you. The floor is yours. All right. Well, welcome everybody. This is the history of public health. My name is Julia. I'm a public health educator. Uh, today's presentation will focus on the history of public health and how it's changed the world as we see it. I'll be covering a lot of information, so please save your questions for the end or um, just put the questions in the chat box, write down any questions you have. Um, you may also enter questions in the chat, as I said. The roots of public health were planted hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and now it has developed into a large and complex set of branches. So one of the biggest questions you may have is, what is public health? I had the same question during my undergraduate studies. The roots of public health were planted hundreds of years ago and has now developed into a large and complex being. When I'm discussing my job, people often ask, what is public health? Or assume it has something to do with a doctor or a hospital. While public health does concern individual health, the American Public Health Association defines it as promoting and protecting the health of people and the communities where they live, work, and play. On this chart, I've added several of the branches of public health. We'll go into more detail on several of these branches later in the presentation. This slide comes from the CDC and shows 10 essential public health services, which are grouped under three core functions. These services are not a prescription for what public health agencies should be doing. Instead, they're intended to kind of show what it is in general that these agencies actually do. There are three core functions of public health, which are assessment, policy development, and assurance. Assessment is where we try and figure out what it is the public needs, whether it's rabies vaccinations because of an outbreak, um, help with getting food because of mobility problems, or even determining that the rate of obesity in our county is higher than the state rate. The next core function is policy development, where we try and determine how to address this need. This can be done by teaching people about the issues, asking community groups to help us to address it, or even helping create new policies that will help address the need. For example, if we were trying to address childhood obesity, we could do this by teaching people about healthy food choices or bringing this issue to the attention of parents and teaching them about the healthier food options for the children. We could even ask that the boys and girls clubs, for example, help us by adding in more gym time in their after school programs. So for policies, we can see this when the New York State Board of Education asks schools to offer more fresh foods or vegetables or asks the schools to stop offering ice cream in the vending machines or something like that. The third core function is assurance, where we work to make sure that any efforts that were put in are kept in place. If we're sticking with the childhood obesity example, this could mean that the school gets in trouble with the Board of Education if they don't offer healthier options. One may also make sure those implementing the efforts are educated in what they're promoting and do research to make sure that their efforts are actually working. Do we we also link Sorry, we did have somebody put in there. If you would just mind slowing down a little bit. I know that we're talking fast, but it's um, if you could just slow down and just a touch. Okay. Thank you. We also link people to or provide care to help individuals keep up their own efforts or perhaps provide other materials that could address anything stopping someone from being able to address this need, like translating materials into other languages or adjusting a health campaign to be relevant to different cultures. These three core functions really do a great job describing what some of the pieces of public health address. But I know it's kind of a complicated subject, so if you have any questions, again, just put them in the chat or write them down and I will address them at the end. Now that we have talked about what public health is, we are going to look at its origins and major achievements throughout history. I know this is an early time to be even considering public health since there weren't any written records or anything. 
uh, but I felt it was important to include early people since their health was affected by their environment, which is a large part of community and environmental health. Originally, hunters and gatherers had rich diets that had a lot of hunted meat and gathered nuts and berries, and they were also moving constantly. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds like a pretty healthy lifestyle. They were working out a bunch, eating fruits, vegetables, and meat. No processed foods, no soda, no candy. However, people during this time didn't live all that long, likely because they had trouble getting enough food, didn't have health care, and didn't really have any specific safe places to go if there were any predators out, among other reasons. During this time, there were not many problems with the buildup of garbage and other waste, or food or water contamination. There were a few reasons for this, including that people were always on the move. So any garbage and waste, including fecal matter, was kind of scattered about, which is important because this meant that there were not many chances for food or water to become contaminated and any nuisances or vermin attracted to these things wouldn't really come into contact with the early humans. Around 10,000 before Common Era, there was a shift from mostly hunting and gathering to mostly settling. This time period was called the Neolithic Agricultural Revolution and provided a foundation for modern day society. It started out in the Middle East in what was called the Fertile Crescent and spread to other parts of the world over time. When people began to settle, they would grow crops and breed and domesticate animals to help them with the farming and to have a food source. While this was helpful for safety, having a consistent food supply and having a place to live and stay without constantly moving, this also led to an accumulation of waste and an increase in red to mosquitoes who carried disease. This meant that people were more likely to become diseased due to being increasingly exposed to these disease carrying creatures. Just to reconnect all of this to public health now, those who work in environmental health often do work to make it so that these nuisances don't live in the same places where people live such as baiting for rodents and enforcing rules about having standing water, which attracts mosquitoes. When people get diseases, someone who works in epidemiology would try and find out the source of the disease to stop it from spreading. Back to prehistoric farmers, settling led to a major dietary change, where people began to eat only one or two crops instead of the diverse diet that they followed before. The type of crops grown depended on the region, as early farmers often grew the crops that were easiest to grow. In the Fertile Crescent, this was wheat, in Asia, it was rice and millet, and in Mexico, it was squash and maize. There were many pros and cons to this change in lifestyle, but this new lifestyle helped act as a foundation. After this move into farming culture set the groundwork for civilizations, the Indus Valley civilization began around 7,000 before Common Era. This civilization was thought to be located in India and was thought to be about 5 million people strong before it began to decline. Um, the exact reason is unknown, but it is believed that the decline may have been because of climate change, which would have caused the river that fueled their society to dry up, or it could have been because of overpopulation if the civilization didn't have enough food or water to support it. During this civilization's time, houses actually had flushing toilets, a sewer system, and drainage systems that were comparable to those found in ancient Rome years later. They even had public baths, just like ancient Rome. The Indus Valley civilization took place during the Bronze Age, where there were some attempts at writing and there was a use of bronze, meaning tools were becoming more advanced. There were many other civilizations that rose and fell during the Bronze Age, and this continued into the Iron Age. The Iron Age had great advances in writing, which made it easier for people to communicate. But during this time, people also discovered metal tools, which led to development of metal weapons. With these metal weapons came more wars, leading to the rise and fall of many, many civilizations, and also a lot of destruction, that likely affected the amount of texts available prior to this time period. With a lack of text to show any significant public health advances, and after all of the warring during this time, we find ourselves in ancient Rome as our next stop on our public health journey. In ancient Rome, many believed that cleanliness led to good health. This was important because it meant that there was a belief that illnesses could be prevented. The common idea was that illnesses happened because of something someone did whether it was a spirit that wanted to cause some mischief or someone was a bad person so the gods punished them. Now, people were learning that they could do something to stop themselves and others from becoming sick. With this belief becoming more common, ancient Rome is thought to be the first society in which there was a focus on stopping diseases from happening instead of just treating them as they happened. In ancient Rome, it was realized that more people were getting sick and dying around marshes and swamps. Although this was likely due to dirty water and mosquitoes biting people, 
Many still believe that the gods decided on how long someone's life would be. So temples were built around the swamps to appease the gods. Ancient Romans also drained the swamps um, to prevent people living near them from getting sick. Ancient Romans thought that being sick or sickly could be associated with bad air, bad water, swamps, sewage, debris, and a lack of personal cleanliness. In response to these beliefs, they provided clean water through those aqueducts, um, the sewers, and the public toilets that I had mentioned earlier with the Indus Valley civilization. They also encouraged people to use those large public baths that were built. These are reminiscent of the Indus Valley civilization um, and are also some good examples of the behaviors encouraged by those who work in public health today. From an environmental health perspective, having a system to get rid of waste and wastewater helps keep rats from hanging around and possibly getting people sick. And having clean and uncontaminated water is important for drinking and bathing, again, to prevent illness. The time of ancient Greece overlapped quite a bit with ancient Rome. However, they contributed very different things to public health. Ancient Greece tend to focus more on the health of each person rather than of the community as the whole. If we were comparing that to today, that would be like if there were fewer services like Meals on Wheels and more doctor's offices and visits per person. So unlike ancient Rome, a majority of ancient Greece focused on the disease and the cure rather than presenting the disease. From the mythological perspective, all ailments like pain, sadness, and disease were introduced when Prometheus stole fire and gave it to the humans. Zeus, king of the gods, decided to get back at him and the humans. So he introduced Prometheus's brother, Epimetheus, to his future wife, Pandora. Zeus then gave a box containing all diseases, sorrows, vices, and crimes that are a burden on humans to Epimetheus. When her husband wasn't home, Pandora wanted to know what was in the box, so she decided to open it and see. When she did, all of these bad things were thought to have been introduced into the world, hence the phrase Pandora's box. From the scientific perspective, there was a need to find the source of diseases and to help people get into better health. People during this time began to learn more about science, and they helped contribute to the studies of physiology, anatomy, and psychology. In fact, the most dominant philosophy was focused on maintaining health and the importance of understanding the whole consideration of patients' health and health status. This is similar to what we now call holistic healing. While many doctors tend to treat symptoms, doctors who take a holistic look at a patient tend to look at why symptoms are happening, what could be contributing to them, and how this could affect someone down the road. For example, if I tend to get sick a lot, a doctor who practices holistic healing might look at my diet, what vitamins I take, my blood work, my stress levels, my environment, and other things to figure out why I'm getting sick so much, since there are many reasons someone might get sick. It could be a food allergy, mold, low vitamin D levels, or something else. This is different than a doctor who sees that you're sick, prescribes allergy medicine or antibiotics, and sends you on your way. So Hippocrates was actually a really good example of a doctor who believed in holistic medicine and was considered to be the founder of ancient Greek medicine. He believed that medicine should be practiced as a scientific discipline based on the natural sciences and thought that diagnosing and preventing diseases was just as important as treating them. Hippocrates helped contribute to the creation of the Hippocratic Corpus, which was a collection of medical works, and the Hippocratic Oath, which served as a code of ethics for physicians. These works helped to shape many different parts of individual health, and the Hippocratic Oath is actually still in use today, although it's been drastically revised. While it may seem like a big leap to go from covering ancient Greece and Rome to the plague, it only makes sense because in the time between the fall of ancient Rome and ancient Greece through the plague, there were many wars. During wartime, it was thought there was less of a concern for public health as people in war zones were focused on surviving or fighting rather than um, the particulars of keeping the community in good health. Like during the Iron Age, it's possible that there were public health advances. However, um, wartime destruction, the Dark Ages, the changes of power in Rome, Greece, China, and Europe overall had a toll on any written records of it. The printing press wasn't invented until the year 1043 in China. So any documentation previously was handwritten once with no ability to make more copies unless they were also handwritten. That being said, fast forwarding to the plague, it was thought that it began in 1347 in Italy and spread to Northern Europe by December 1350. There were many theories about what the source of the plague was. Some people thought it was caused by person to person contact, sun exposure, or perhaps intentional poisoning. But one of the most popular theories was that the plague was caused by miasmas which were thought to be invisible vapors that came from swamps or cesspools, which then floated around in the air and were inhaled. In fact, popes in the churches donned hoods, masks, gloves, and a sack over the nose to counteract these miasmas. 
in addition to using aromatic herbs in the nose, which were thought to neutralize them, and lighting fires on both ends of a room to counteract them. The real causes of the plague from the standpoint of historians now was that there were more people living closely together and a failure to dispose of garbage properly, which attracted rats and enabled the rat population to explode. These rats were thought to have harbored fleas and bacteria for years without difficulty, but it wasn't until this type of close-knit environment was created that pe by people that it really became a problem. So the fleas would carry the bacteria that caused the plague in their intestine and when an infected flea would jump onto a person they would introduce that bacteria when they took a big bite out of their new human host the bacteria carried by these fleas would then spread to the lymph nodes and multiply causing dark tender swollen nodules otherwise known as buboes which were large bubbles of skin that would cause the victim to have a headache fever delirium and death in 60 percent of cases as you can see on the map there were multiple waves of the plague uh, as it spread from Asia to the Black Sea, then through the Mediterranean Sea, through Sicily and Italy, up through France and Northern Europe, and even into Scandinavia. This is where the phrase spreads like the plague comes from, because in a few years' time, it swept through many countries with those who got it having less than a 50% chance of living. Now, remember, at this point, humans had not yet developed a structured way to think about what could be causing this disease. Essentially, they had not yet come up with the concepts behind epidemiology. However, they knew that stopping the disease from spreading was important. So during this time is when the concepts of quarantine and isolation were born. The word quarantine comes from the Italian word quarantana, which means 40 day period. Since the first known quarantines during these times were for 40 days. So this is way longer than the two week quarantines you're seeing during COVID times. If you're not familiar, quarantine is where someone who's suspected to potentially have a disease separates themselves to prevent other people from getting sick before they confirm they're sick or perhaps aren't showing symptoms. Isolation is where someone who is known to have a disease is kept away from others to prevent the spread of that disease. During the bubonic plague, incoming goods, travelers, and anyone who is suspected to be ill were put in a quarantine to try and contain the spread of the plague. Some cities and towns even had cordon sanitaire, which was a physical barrier in a town or city that would block off certain parts of that area if there were known to be many sick people there. If there was a cordon sanitaire, you had to have specific permission to leave that area. The practice of using a cordon sanitaire persisted into the late 19th and early 20th centuries, such as in San Francisco during a resurgence of the plague in 1899 and during the SARS epidemic in Toronto in 2003. In China in 1910, there was actually a great Manchurian plague and a cordon sanitaire actually helped to bring an end to this plague. During the 18th century after the plague, there were some lingering effects like isolation and quarantine becoming commonplace and there being councils for enforcing isolation and quarantine measures. In 1647, Boston drew up an ordinance requiring all arriving ships to pause at the harbor entrance or be fined $100, which was about $6,500 in today's dollars. So they were not being lenient about these restrictions. In 1701, Massachusetts had enacted a statute that said all individuals suffering from plague, smallpox, and other contagious diseases had to be isolated in separate houses. So civilizations in Europe actually began using materials from smallpox scabs as a sort of vaccine for smallpox after they heard that the Eastern nations were seeing less people dying after using these methods. China and India were the first nations to use inoculation in as early as 200 before Common Era where they used smallpox scabs and sores and either ground them up and inhaled them or scratched it into their skin. What had been reported from Constantinople where they had been using these measures for at least 40 years before they did in Europe was that people of all sexes, ages, and temperaments were having slight symptoms after inoculation, but none of them had found to die of smallpox. There were no scars or pits in the face after being inoculated, unlike those who had smallpox. In America, which came to be during the 18th century, the U.S. Marine Hospital was established. This was like a precursor to the U.S. Public Health Service. With all that had happened, you would have expected that there would be a rapid increase in public health measures and more learned about disease, community wellness, and other aspects of people's health. Well, that's exactly what happened. The years following the plague included an age of enlightenment, which lasted from approximately 1700 to 1850. Before I get into the Age of Enlightenment, I wanted to discuss the big advances in public health of the 19th century, since the Age of Enlightenment occurs during the 18th and early 19th centuries. 
So as the age of enlightenment continues, epidemiology was founded and the notion of the sanitary idea began. A man named John Snow attempted to determine the cause of cholera outbreaks in the area. This man is considered the father of epidemiology as the work he did helped study the disease and how it spread, which summarizes what epidemiology is today. The notion of the sanitary idea was that there were many changes that were made to the state of public health in England and in the newly established USA as well. For example, now sewage systems were implemented and water supplies were monitored and protected in these areas. The 19th century was also the time during which the United States appointed the first supervising surgeon, after which many changes to the position and associations became the Surgeon General. During the Age of Enlightenment, there was a value shift where people began to embrace democracy, citizenship, reason, rationality, and the social value of intelligence. It only makes sense that America was established during this time period. Jeremy Bentham during this time created a philosophy of thought called utilitarianism that provided a basis for social policies and health policies. It was an ethical theory that aimed to maximize happiness for all individuals. The thought was that if you maximized happiness, this would lead to healthy workers who are able to contribute to the state economy. So during the 1800s, occurrences of the plague had dwindled, but cholera was on the rise and was a big threat to health. So cholera is still a problem in the world today, and we still regularly see outbreaks. The first cholera epidemic in London happened in 1831. At this point, the common theories behind the spread of cholera was that it was either spread by miasmas, which again were those invisible particles, or by person-to-person -person contact. John Snow was an apprentice to a physician during this time. He had been examining victims and observed that the initial symptoms for all victims were always related to the gastrointestinal tract. He thought this was weird because if cholera was spread by vapors in the air, he thought it'd make more sense to see problems with the lungs. He thought that it was possible that cholera was actually transmitted by food or water. In his paper on the mode of communication of cholera, he presented his theory that cholera was caused by ingesting contaminated water, but it didn't gain much traction in the medical community. Despite the lack of reception and the slowing of cholera spread in 1849, Snow continued to collect data on the pattern of disease and began to find evidence that cholera was linked to specific water sources. He began to interview people living in the area, asking them where they were getting their water from, and also looked into where the nearby pumps were getting their water from. At this time, water came from wells that had different water sources. And even though he brought forth evidence that the death rates were higher in houses that got their water from certain pumps, he was told that he had not proven that the water itself had been contaminated. So even though the last cholera outbreak ended in 1849, another began in 1853 in the Broad Street area of London. Many residents began to flee because they didn't want to deal with this outbreak. As you can see in the picture, there was one main pump in the Broad Street area, so snow became suspicious of this pump. While the water samples did not show obvious contamination, snow immediately began to collect detailed information on where the victims got their drinking water. He found that the vast majority got their water from the Broad Street pump. He brought this up at a local board meeting, provided this evidence, and argued that the handle should be removed as a precaution. Well, the board reluctantly decided to remove the pump handle on September 8, September 8, 1854. So this chart shows the number of cholera deaths per day. The area is pointing to the day that the pump handle was reluctantly removed, and after that, you can see that the cholera deaths dwindled out pretty quickly compared to the last outbreak that had lasted several years. It was eventually found that someone had washed a dirty diaper in the town well, which contaminated the water in the well. So removing the pump handle appeared to help bring an end to that cholera epidemic. And with that, there was now an idea of how to, dis how to study disease and its sources. So shortly after this epidemic, public health began to take its shape in London and Paris as the notion of the sanitary idea began due to the devastating health consequences of the Industrial Revolution, which had also just begun. There were several reasons why public health became a necessity during this time. For example, the power of the states had previously been based on commerce and trade, but now it considered the health and fitness of the working population. Because of this, in 1837, England began to have formalized records of births, deaths, and marriages, which were used to monitor the health of the people. 
Another factor behind the establishment of public health was that poor health more often fell on people in poverty. A physician trying to understand the mortality rate differences um, tried different ways to see why they would be higher in one place over another. So he tried to see if mortality rates, which are death rates, were related to distance from rivers, the relationship of the street to the wind, sun exposure, soil type, even elevation levels, but found no correlation. It wasn't until he attempted to correlate tax rates as an indicator of wealth with mortality rates that he found a significant correlation, meaning that they affected each other. Public health became an established discipline in England in 1848 with the passage of the Public Health Act after a group of local people campaigned for it and another cholera outbreak, outbreak began. In this act, a central public health administration was created. This administration directed authorities at the local boards of health on the matters of drains, sewers, street cleaning, and regulated housing, nuisances, and offensive trades, which are trades or industries that damage the health and or economic interests of the people exposed to that trade, an example being coal miners. The Central Board of Health had good intent, however, they had limited powers and no money. The act overall provided a framework that could be used by local authorities, but it was difficult to move to action when there was no money that could be used to improve programs, infrastructure, what have you. Reformers of the 1830s worked endlessly to resolve problems like the sewage in the living quarters and flowing down the street, which resulted in the passage of several more public health acts. Eventually, the Public Health Act of 1875 was passed to consolidate all of them. With this act, the local boards of health were replaced by rural and urban sanitary authorities, which had jurisdiction over the newly created urban and rural sanitary districts. The newly established authorities had much more power than the local boards of health that were there before. They were tasked with creating and maintaining the sewer system, controlling water supplies, regulating housing, and regulating new streets and buildings. They were allowed to make sure that homes were connected to the sewer system and wouldn't allow new homes to be built without being connected. Local authorities were also told to inspect for nuisances and were given the ability to serve notices for them. The nuisances that were to be inspected for included growing waste piles, overcrowding in homes, and unclean workplaces. They also prohibited any new shanty houses from being built. Shanty houses were usually poorly constructed homes with little access to water, sewers, and the like. This new act was huge for public health because now they could do they could better ensure that there were environmental health standards and would protect the health of the people of Britain. So that brings us to the 20th century. In the United States, there were many public health advancements made due to technology, innovation, and a consideration for health and safety. Listed here are a few of the advancements made. By the end of the 20th century, there were improvements in motor vehicle safety from engineering efforts to make vehicles and highways safe to successful efforts to change personal behavior, which included increased use of safety belts, child safety seats, and motorcycle helmets, and decreased drinking and driving. Problems like coal workers' pneumonicosis, black lung, and silicosis were decreasing, especially with the establishment of organizations like OSHA. They also worked to decrease severe injuries and deaths related to mining, manufacturing, construction, and transportation. During the 20th century, they also added safety measures in the workplace, which resulted in a reduction of 40% of fatal occupational injuries. We also saw more control of infectious diseases because of clean water and improved sanitation, which led to a reduction in typhoid fever and cholera. Antimicrobial therapy controls were created for infections such as tuberculosis and sexually transmitted infections. During the 20th century, there was a decline in deaths from coronary heart disease and stroke due to smoking cessation and blood pressure control, as well as improved access to early detection and better treatment. Since the 1964 Surgeon General's report on the health risks of smoking, the prevalence of smoking in adults decreased as public health anti-smoking campaigns helped prevent the initiation of tobacco use, promote cessation of use, and reduce exposure to environmental smoke. Since 1900, food has become safer and healthier. This is because there were decreases in microbial contamination and increases in nutritional content. Not only were more food safety controls put into place, but essential micronutrients were identified and food fortification programs were established. This has nearly eliminated major nutritional deficiency diseases, such as rickets, goiter, and pellagra in the United States. Fluoridation of drinking water prevents tooth decay regardless of socioeconomic status or access to care. 
mothers and babies have become healthier due to better hygiene, nutrition, the availability of antibiotics, greater access to health care, and technologic advances in maternal and neonatal medicine. Since 1900, there has been a decrease in infant mortality of 90% and a decrease in maternal mortality of 99%. In addition to increases in child and maternal health, there was an increase in access to family planning and contraceptive services. This led to smaller family sizes and longer lengths of time between children. There were also increased opportunities for preconceptional counseling and screening, fewer infant, child, and maternal deaths, and increased use of barrier contraceptives to prevent pregnancy and venereal disease. In addition to the advances I've already mentioned, there were more public health advances um, such as the establishment of OSHA, the CDC, FDA, EPA, and many other organizations created with the intent to regulate and protect various aspects of public health. The Great Manchurian Plague in China in 1910 helped demonstrate the need for a place where scientists were able to come together and discuss matters related to health and disease, as this had worked well following the plague in China. So the World Health Organization was established in 1948. There has also been a lot of changes to the role of Surgeon General, but it's been in its current form since 1987. The Surgeon General is considered the nation's doctor and oversees the U.S. Public Health Service, whose mission is to protect, promote, and advance the health of our nation. The Surgeon General actually provides a lot of public health missions or um, calls to action that promote different activities to increase public health overall, such as for breastfeeding, physical activity, quitting smoking, decreasing violence, decreasing skin cancer, and increasing health literacy. I highly recommend taking a look at their website and learning more about it. Before we talk a little bit more about the public health advances, I wanted to show you a quick video of what the roadways were like in the 20th century. We're only going to watch the first couple seconds, but as you can see, the road is filled with this train. We got the buggies all going. There's no lights. These people are just walking wherever in the road. That guy's just walking across like it's fine. So, um, you know, now we have actual signals in place and safety measures to protect people. So that's really good. Outside of the United States, there were several countries also experiencing changes in the way they viewed the public health. In India, the Madras Public Health Act was passed in 1939. So starting in the 1600s, Britain provided medical officers and ruled India, so this was the first established act that India passed without British intervention. This act was established, or this act established public health authorities, a public health board and all of its functions, which included things that were similar to our public health board. Um, you know, ensuring sanitary conveniences, bathrooms, abating nuisances, controlling diseases, treating and preventing venereal disease, food safety, uh, just to name a few. Their Public Health Act was a bit more advanced than the one originally adopted in England. However, it came over 50 years later, so that's to be expected. In 1910 in China, as I mentioned, there was the Great Manchurian Plague. Over 2,600 people died, um, even with travel restrictions, quarantines, and face mask use. Uh, this plague was similar to the bubonic plague of Europe, as the dead were loaded into freight cars, mass regulations for quarantine were in place, and those who worked in fur trapping and training businesses were quarantined as well, since it was believed that the origin was diseased animals commonly used for their furs. So, unlike the bubonic plague, the Great Manchurian Plague was pneumonic, meaning that the lungs were infected infected rather than the lymph nodes. And this plague actually had nearly a 100% death rate. After the People's Republic was established in 1949, there was a great increase in public health efforts where life expectancy soared by about 30 years, infant mortality plummeted, and smallpox, sexually transmitted infections, and many other infections were eliminated or decreased massively in incidence, largely as a result of communicable disease control. By the mid-1970s, China actually underwent a epidemiologic transition years ahead of other nations of similar economic status. These early successes can be attributed to population mobilization, mass campaigns, and a focus on sanitation, hygiene, clean water, and clean delivery, and occurred despite political instability and slow economic progress. In the 10-year Cultural Revolution beginning in 1966, 
Public health programs continue through the establishment of community based health workers and community funded medical schemes. However, in 1980, market reforms led to the deterioration of people focused approaches. In China held a laissez faire approach to public health, as seen through this large outbreak of SARS in 2003. So, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we do in the county here. Um, just wanted to share a few key points about the history of the health department. So, um, our health department was actually established in 1947, the first sanitary code being established in 1948. This is the code that we use for inspections of homes, restaurants, um, and other parts of everyday society. So, it started with a budget of over $2 million, which is about $22 million when adjusted for inflation since 1947. And our current budget is somewhere around $47 million. The population has increased since then by a little over 100,000 people, but the health problems have increased drastically due to decreased physical activity, increased rates of obesity, increased use of opiates, and changes in drug use habits, among many other differences in the dynamics of our society that can lead to an increase in health problems. Inspections of water and watering facilities began in 1952, and food inspections began a year later. Ensuring food and water safety has certainly decreased foodborne and contamination related illnesses since they began. And we have similar inspections and procedures still in place today. Most of these inspections that happen are in our environmental health sector. Um, we also had the SOC polio vaccine field trials. Um, and then we, we achieved fluoridation about 11 years after um, it began in 1944. Um, we started doing animal rabies clinics in 1959, and in 1971, we established a new maternal and child health division, which initiated four new programs, blood testing and screening, sickle cell disease testing, pregnant schoolgirl program, and a teenage health clinic. So, to talk a little bit about environmental health specifically, um, often what the work entails is conducting inspections. So, I've listed a few different types of inspections, which include, um, you know, those restaurants, the water systems, pools, tattoo shops, children's camps, housing, senior centers, and daycares. Um, in this picture, I show a, a corner with a little rat bait box and also a lot of mold on the wall. Um, and that's the kind of stuff we're looking, well, we're hoping to not see, but often do see. When I used to work as a sanitarian, we had to make um, take different photos of different situations, whether it was to bring back to the office for evaluation or to document our actions. So in these photos, these are ones I took. Um, you can see that some food here is vacuum sealed without any labeling on it of what it is or when it was sealed, which can be dangerous because certain bacteria grow best in places where there's no air. And if it's been a long enough period of time, this bacteria present can become toxic and even fatal. In the photo on the right, it's not easy to see, but there is water all over the basement floor, which attracts mosquitoes. There's mold all over this wall. And then also, uh, it's hard to see, but little rat droppings down here. Um, so that means that there's rats that are able to access these basements. So we do inspections to check for these environmental health hazards. So this slide is also from when I worked as a sanitarian. It's hard to see here. But on this lawn, there's some bright green water sitting on the top of it. So part of what we do is we do inspections of people's septic systems when they have a private septic system. And that includes flushing a bunch of water down a toilet with a bunch of bright green dye. And if we see bright green dye on the lawn like this, that means their system isn't working properly because it's supposed to kind of dissipate into the ground. Um, the only place we're supposed to see this is in an inspection tank. Um, you know, like the place we're supposed to see it. We shouldn't see it surfacing like this. Um, so, you know, that says a lot about the way that people need to make sure to keep up that kind of stuff. Um, because septic systems, it depends on what kind you have, but they only last a certain period of time. So they do need some maintenance. And typically you'll see these in places like Eden or Angola or Collins, um, usually places that aren't very close together. So the picture on the left is just a couple pictures of books, and um, but it's from a fair we held regarding child lead poisoning back in 2019. 
So if you're not familiar with the child lead problem here in Buffalo, there's some older homes that have lead in the paint. Um, this long-term exposure can actually negatively impact children. And we see ongoing issues like lower IQs and asthma because of their exposure. So we actually have an entire program dedicated to reducing child lead exposures, kind of like the one that I had mentioned was established several years ago. Um, we also help people use lead safe practices when we're painting or doing work on a home. So the picture on the right is another picture from an installation of a part of a product set septic system called an absorption trench. Um, I just thought it was a neat picture because it's kind of like a second treatment that goes on the back of your system if you have a sand, silt, sand filter system. Um, and it kind of just helps water dissipate into the ground and acts as a second kind of like less rigorous treatment. So another part of the work done at the county for public health is by our community wellness division, which is where I'm from. Um, we do many different types of outreach and do work in many different areas. So we try to prevent opioid deaths, the spread of STIs, and try to increase healthy behaviors like smoking cessation, increasing physical activity, chronic disease management, diabetes management, and eating properly. So if you ever need help quitting smoking or need some condoms, um, you know who to reach out to now. <laughs> so we try and evaluate the health needs of the community every few years and do work in those areas to help bring attention and address those needs. For example, we know that heart health is a big issue in our area, so we try and set up blood pressure stations and teach people how to manage high blood pressure so that they're more aware of their health status. High blood pressure, it sounds really common, so a lot of people just accept it, but there's a reason that it's a problem, and it's because it can be a sign of other health conditions or it can be a precursor to a blood clot. There's so many different things that can cause high blood pressure. So if you or someone you know has it, just make sure they contact a medical provider to see what could be causing it and how to properly manage it. We also sometimes provide blood pressure cuffs to areas of the public to help increase a community's health knowledge and awareness. For example, we're part of a healthy corner store initiative where we recruit corner stores to provide healthy options like fruits and vegetables so that these healthful foods are convenient and available for people in the area. One thing we've done before is actually provided blood pressure stations to these healthy corner stores so that people can be even more aware of their health status. Epidemiology is another department that helps address public health issues in Erie County. As we discussed before, epidemiology is the study of disease and how it spreads, and that's exactly what they do. Um, they attempt to identify the sources of disease outbreaks and help to coordinate any responses to those outbreaks. For example, a few years ago, there were several different hepatitis A outbreaks. Epidemiology investigated and determined that the source of the outbreaks were a few specific local restaurants. After determining the source, they helped set up vaccination clinics for hepatitis A and then referred the restaurant to environmental health for them to inspect and see where this disease came from. Usually it's a specific employee who is sick and then spreads it um, as they're preparing people's foods without gloves or practicing using unsafe sanitary practices. Um, so environmental often goes in and interviews the employees and manager on where and how they should adjust their practices to make a safer food environment. They also coordinate follow up for animal bites and um, did a lot of the work with coordinating the contact tracing for the COVID-19 pandemic. Emergency preparedness is another department created to help protect public health in Erie County. They are ones who often coordinate vaccination clinics, make response plans for any potential hazards or problems to come up in the county, conduct drills to test these plans, and create a competent trained staff to be part of these plans if something were to happen. For example, they're helping to run the COVID vaccination clinics, but also help those with those hepatitis A clinics that I mentioned before. While epidemiology identifies the needs for the clinics, emergency preparedness runs the clinics. They also help provide integrated shelter support when needed, like with the Burt Flickinger Center when all the homeless, sh homeless shelters were closed at the beginning of COVID. Shown here are some sweet animals that were in attendance at some of the rabies clinics that have been provided by them. They don't all look super thrilled about getting a shot, but supplying these yearly rabies clinics helps prevent the spread of rabies, as it is often fatal when transmitted to a person. There's like six shots you have to get if you're bit by a bat, and there's a reason for that. So during COVID, all divisions of the Department of Health worked together to protect public health. People from environmental, community wellness, emergency preparedness, and many other departments were working the COVID information lines. 
epidemiology signed on people for contact tracing, emergency preparedness, use people from all types of departments to help work the vaccination clinics. So for all the work we do at all times, regardless of COVID, our departments all have the common goal of protecting the health of Erie County residents. And thankfully, we have all of these departments and efforts in place to promote public health to all peoples, regardless of race, income level, or current health status. So that being said, public health is extremely important and there is actually a lot that goes into it. You'd be surprised. Does anyone have any questions? First, I'd just like to thank you, Julia, for walking us through that. That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing a couple comments and one question right now. So folks, if you have anything, pop it right in. So the first comment I'm seeing is, Really need to know that holistic healing dates back to 800 BCE. I would agree with that. That's pretty neat. Uh, the next comment is, this has been really interesting. Thank you. And the question I'm seeing is, how do you think the perception of public health has changed since the beginning of COVID? Um, honestly, it's, I think it's probably about the same because there's always been people who are very, very pro public health. They're very, very, um, you know, dedicated to make like, well, here, obviously we do a lot of work to protect public health and a lot of the ship focus shift to COVID, but in the general public, I mean, I feel like it mostly was pretty consistent with what people's views already were. Like, I don't think anyone became more negatively focused on public health. I think it actually opened up a lot of people's eyes to how much work we actually do to protect the public, even, you know, even if there's a lot of people who don't want us to, um, it'd be about the same ratio, I would say personally, but I can't speak on behalf of the county or what the truth of the matter is, but that's just based on what I've seen working like vaccination clinics being on the information lines, um, doing the data management for epidemiology. Like I've done so much different stuff and talked to so many different people, even in the restaurants, like I was doing those inspections during COVID. And even, you know, at that point, I mean, like, obviously the restaurants were frustrated, but people understood that for the majority, people understood that for the sake of public health, you know, they need to do what they need to do. So I felt like it was pretty consistent, honestly. That's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. I'm glad someone asked that question. Um, oh, we have a comment. I didn't realize how much the health department did. Oh, yeah, and even more. <laughs> It's really, it's amazing how many initiatives we have and considering, you know, like, I mean, community wellness alone, we handle like, we do child maternal health, um, food related issues, green team, live well. We just have a lot of different things we're a part of and we're only four people. So you can only imagine how much work, like our epidemiology department, for example, when this all started, I wanna say they were like five or six people and then they expanded to maybe eight people. So anyone who was frustrated, not getting a call back from them, now you know why. <laughs> there's not a lot of people there, but yeah, there's a lot of work that we do. It's very diverse and very interesting. You learn a lot. It sounds like it. Um, we have interesting to know how long contact tracing has been around, even though most people just learned about it due to COVID. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, it's been around even for like, you know, like our sexual health clinics have been doing it for years, you know, um, just because it's a thing for them too. You know, people get anonymous texts like, oh, you've been exposed to such and such. You know, there's different ways that they relay that information. Um, typically they call and say, you know, anonymous party did this, but yeah, contact tracing has been around a long, long time. Yeah, and interesting just to know about all of the terminology that you never thought you'd say so much like quarantine or anything like <laughs> that. So. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions come through, so we'll just give it a second here, Julia, because I know you got to take off. Um, now I'm just seeing thanks for the presentation today. So thank you for your time. I'll connect with you later. And everyone who's on, thank you so much. We'll see you all next time. All right. See you guys. All right. Bye.